So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Jessica Field. I am the Community Outreach and Education Coordinator here at ARCH. And I'm here with our self, one of our self-advocates and respecting rights members, Sarah J. We are here to talk a little bit to you about ARCH Disability Law Center and our project at ARCH called Respecting Rights. Take it away, Sarah. Introduce yourself if you want. All right. So do you want me to do you want me to say what the t discussion topics are or did you just do that? Uh, no, we haven't done the discussion topics. If you just want to introduce yourself, that would be okay. great. I I am Sarah J and I am one as Jessica just said, uh I am one of the uh respecting rights uh core group members. Thank you. And I just introduced myself, but I wanted to give a little bit of background. So I joined ARCH in 2022, but before that, I had worked in developmental services for about 10 years. I started as a part-time staff and worked my way up into a supervisory role, uh, working in different group homes, supported independent living, transitional aged youth, passport funding, uh, uh, fee-for-service, you name it, I've I've uh, worked in it. So just to give you a little bit of background that I do come from developmental services. Okay, Sarah, go ahead. All right. So today's discussion um, topics, uh, the first thing um, Jessica is going to um, talk a little bit about ARCH because I can't. Um, <laughs> uh, now we're going to talk about what was, what uh, what is respecting rights and then um, I'll introduce the team then uh, stoplight cards and past projects and initiatives then current projects and initiatives um, and then why this work is important which basically Jessica puts me on the spot uh, and then like what is the next what is next for respecting rights and then questions of course and how you you can get involved oh yeah and that okay <laughs> and so a little bit about arch um, arch disability law center is a disability rights legal clinic and we're located in toronto um, but we are dedicated to defending and advancing the equality rights entitlements fundamental freedoms and inclusion of low-income persons with disabilities across uh, Ontario. So even though we're located in Toronto, we serve um, people with disabilities all across Ontario. And we are primarily funded by Legal Aid Ontario. And if you'd like to learn more about ARCH, you can visit our website at archdisabilitylaw.ca. So there's a few services that ARCH provides, um, five main ones. The first one is called uh, Test Case Litigation. And these are cases uh, whose outcomes will affect a large number of people uh, with disabilities or who will significantly affect the law as it relates to rights of people with disabilities in Ontario. Then we have public legal education, and that's kind of where respecting rights falls uh, into. So this is where we provide legal education to people with disabilities regarding their legal rights um, and any new developments that are happening in the law. We offer presentations, we offer workshops and seminars, and we also produce plain language accessible written materials. And all of our written materials can be found on our website as well too. And then we have our Arch Alert. And what that is, it's our quarterly newsletter. And I have an example of what an Arch Alert looks like here in the, the photo there. Um, we send these out every three months and basically it's just, where we can share like news, what has changed in the law, um, and any information on disability rights or um, our arch work, stuff that we're working on. And then we have publications. Those are things like toolkits, uh, fact sheets, and guides, and they can also be accessed on our website. Lastly, we have summary advice and referral services. And now for uh, anyone working in developmental services, uh, this is a great resource um, for the people that you support if they feel like they need legal advice. They can call ARCH and we give free confidential legal services that um, directly to people with disabilities, um, again, from across Ontario. Um, and we have certain disability related like areas of law is what we call it. So people 
who access our, we call it STAR, uh, STAR services, they can get some legal advice or support in different areas, which include accessibility, law, uh, discrimination in human rights, so like accommodation in the workplace or primary, secondary, post-secondary education, or if they have questions about service animals, um, any attendant or PSW or support services that they might have questions or concerns about. Education law, so rights as a student or rights as a worker with a disability. Decision-making rights, so your right to exercise your capacity to make your own decisions or someone's right to live in a group home and what rights do they have when they live in a congregate setting. And lastly, uh, rights in regards to transportation. For example, we know that there's been a lot of changes um, to wheel trans eligibility. So ARCH does a lot of work around that. Okay, Sarah. All right. So what is like, what is respecting rights? Uh, and uh, respecting rights, sorry, I'm reading off my paper, but uh, respecting rights is a rights education project at Arch Disability Law Center led by people with disabilities. We work in a triple scoop, uh, triple scoop way. So meaning um, the lawyers on the top, the self advocates in the middle, and the advocacy staff on the bottom. Uh, we offer legal rights educational workshops as well as monthly uh, monthly and quarterly meetings for self-advocates. And then occasionally we also engage in accessible law reform work. Next Excellent. Slide. Yeah, I usually put in a picture of a ice cream and when we do our workshops or meetings, we ask participants who likes ice cream and that's how we explain our triple scoop approach. So yeah. um, when we refer to that, we're really talking about like triple scoop ice cream. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, ahead, who doesn't, like, who doesn't like ice cream? Unless it's, yeah. like, 30 degrees below zero, in which case, maybe yeah. not. Um, okay, so our team, obviously, I'm one of the core group members. Um, but I wanted to start off with uh, saying um, Peter Park, which is the one, the fellow the far right the last person um, yeah and he's he was he he's the found he's the founder along with um rob lutanzio and we proudly refer to we proudly refer to him as the godfather um the other group the other uh um core group members um is judy which is um, the first one, then there's Brett, and then there's Marissa, and they're Thank all really you. cool, yes. and they're, we all have a lot to say about, you know, advocacy and making our voices heard and that sorts of stuff. Next slide. Uh, so then we would, oh, yeah. go ahead, Sarah, I forgot. No, you can, no, you can take the floor okay. on this one. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I forgot that um, I have your name there, but we <laughs> created multiple uh, videos throughout the years. We had some funding and we've decided to um, utilize that funding to do legal rights education videos. So I'm just going to share and I'm hoping that this works. I think I have shared my screen correctly, but Sarah, would you be able to tell me if you can hear the video? Yep. please? Okay. Might like maybe a bit louder, but I you can well, hear it. something very to tell you. We want you to listen. Keyword is listen. People labeled as having an intellectual disability have the right to make decisions about their lives. Some people don't know about their rights. We all have the right to make our own decisions. Sometimes we need support to do this. We are so excited to share our message with you. 
We are Respecting Rights, a team of self-advocates, lawyers, and social workers delivering arts-based, accessible rights workshops across Ontario. We deliver these workshops for people labelled with intellectual disabilities, their support staff, and their families. As self-advocates, we made a decision. We decided to work on rights education in a new way. Our rights workshops are accessible. We use art, role play, and music to teach people. We like to have fun while we learn about rights. Working together with lawyers makes our work stronger. Under the law, persons labeled with intellectual disabilities have the right to make their own decisions. It's important to know what the law says. We work with persons labeled with intellectual disabilities across Ontario to make the laws better for them. We call this accessible law reform work. Stay in touch with us. We want to share work with you. It's time for respecting rights. Hey, ah, I love these videos. Let me tell you, it's just, it's so much fun, fun being able to do this kind of work. Yeah. Okay. Go All ahead, right. Sarah. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to introduce uh, the stoplight cards and actually on one of them and it um, it's the, the point of the stoplight cards is people with disabilities have the right to participate equally and they actually look like uh, I took them off the keychain they look like that um and it's a helpful it's a helpful tool for those um with uh, IDD um I have actually used them um during a medical appointment so I can say that they do work. They are effective. Uh, red, um, red is stop. You're not using plain language. I do not understand. Yellow is I understand, but you're talking too quickly, so slow down. And green is uh, everything is fine. Your pace is perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah they, Jane. I like forgot. I said, they do work. <laughs> yeah, I forgot my stoplight cards today, but that's okay. I'm glad you have a copy of yours. So these stoplight cards we made quite a few years ago. Um, again, another funding initiative that we had had. And Sarah J, like she communicated, they're used as a communication tool. And we like to bring these stoplight cards for workshop participants um, or if we're doing presentations, so people can take something home with them and utilize them, whether that's with their staff, their family members, their friends, or during medical appointments or any other sort of maybe appointment that they might have. Um, during the pandemic, we sometimes we were able to um, distribute these stoplight cards, um, but other times we weren't. So when we did our workshops virtually, we kind of got creative a little bit. So um, we typically encourage people when we do our workshops to, if they have the stoplight cards, great. But if not, they can utilize stuff in their house. So whether or not that's uh, like piece of, pieces of fruit, maybe um, some like highlighters, like if you have like a red highlighter, yellow or green, um, anything that's around their house that might um, be those colors. And so participants would use these stoplight cards or items around their house to let us know how we're doing during our workshops and our presentations. Um, so I'm just going to say that if you are interested in um, having some of these stoplight cards for the people that you support, you're more than happy to reach out to me and we can send you a bunch of stoplight cards for the people that you support. Okay, so wanted to talk a little bit about our past projects and initiatives, just so you have an understanding of some of the work that Respecting Rights and Arch has done over the years. Um, we're gonna talk about our Time for Change music video. And I think that we have we have enough time to show our music video. It's about five or six minutes long, but it's one that um, is a really, really good 
video to watch. The next one will be My Voice, My Choice, Phase 2, and that's a series of workshops that we had done and had evaluated, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Then the Get Connected campaign, the Five Things campaign, and um, Sarah J will really talk about our accessible land acknowledgement work that um, she kind of brought to the forefront, and um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that too. Yeah, okay. So our time for change video. Some of you during I the just interject. I know, um, Jason. I'm not putting you on the spot, but um, I know that you've seen it because I showed I showed it during one of the other groups that we were that I was part of. So you've seen it. Good point. Some people might see this. Um, <laughs> it's also on our YouTube channel, but I also really like like we play it quite often. It's, it's a really good video. So during the pandemic, Respecting Rights brought 23 self-advocates together over Zoom um, to share a really powerful message with the world. So we had funding to do this, and we worked with a musician, producer, and a graphic designer uh, to record what human rights means to them. So Respecting Rights and Self-Advocates, um, after they were done with the music video, they had created a set of questions so the people watching this video could reflect on them. They called it Time for Change Discussion Guide. And that guide can be found on our website. It's not a training tool. We don't do training for staff because we really focus on self-advocates, the rights of self-advocates, and really helping them learn about their rights and have a voice. But this is a great way to, um, I guess, reflect on some of the things that you're about to hear. So we often encourage, you know, if you're having a team or leading a team meeting, um, share that information with your team, watch the video together, look at the discussion guide, go through it together, and um, you would find some pretty interesting reflections, hopefully. Um, we have two different guides. So one of them is for staff and working professionals, and the other one is for family caregivers. So families can also watch the video and um, complete the discussion guide as well. Okay, so I'm so glad that we have time to, to I watch this I wanted video. to speak a little bit uh, why I made two points. Um, the Time for Change video uh, was made two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic, and it is absolutely mind-boggling that since it was made, um, it is, and I'd love to know each and every one of these people, uh, but it has actually, since we've made it, it's been viewed 2.4 thousand times. Yeah, we're pretty proud of that. I'm so glad yeah. that people are watching <laughs> the video and we're so happy to share it with the group here today. Okay. Let, let me know if there's any issues with the volume. Okay, Sarah, I tried to yep. turn it up. Time for change. Respecting rights self-advocates share what human rights means to them. Respecting rights is a project at Arch Disability Law Center, led by persons with disabilities. I'm a dreamer, and it's more powerful if we dream together. And when we dream together, we can make change together. It is time for change. We want to be treated equally. And according to the law, we're supposed to be treated equally. At Respecting Rights, self-advocates work with lawyers at Arch Disability Law Center. We learn about what the law says about our rights. There's an international law made with people with disability. It's called the Convention on the Rights of People with Disability. We call it the Convention. There's, there's also Canadian human rights law. The Convention says people with disabilities are equal under the law. The con Convention says persons 
with disabilities should have the same opportunities as everyone else. Under the law, we have the right to accessible information. This means communication is in ways that we can understand. I can do things for myself, and if I need help, I will ask. Don't judge me, get to know me. Everyone. 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 Everyone has the right for respect. Everyone. 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 Everyone has the right to be treated with dignity. Everybody needs to be treated fairly, kindly, and treated all with respect and kindness. Making choices about what's important to me helps me be more independent and in charge of my life. People with disabilities can accomplish anything they want to. All we need is your support. Help us accomplish what we want in our lives. Everyone. 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 Everyone has the right to participate in society. We are all different. Everyone makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect. My disability does not define who I am. I deserve to feel that my voice is being heard and that I am not being discriminated against. I have the right to communicate. Hi. I use a power wheelchair. See beyond my chair and see the person that I am. Don't try and fix me. I am not broken. Treat me with fairness, respect, equality, and allow me my dignity and independence. Don't talk to me like a baby. Everyone. 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 Everyone needs to be seen to be listened to, to be acknowledged, to be celebrated, to be treated with dignity. My sexuality is really important to me. I have the right to choose to be in a relationship of my choosing, whether we are gay, lesbian, trans, we want us to accept us and support us. Everyone. 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 Everyone has a strong and powerful voice somewhere. People just need a chance to be heard. Having my rights is very important to me because it's about me. It's not about my support person. It's about me. And it makes me feel good that I'm making my choice with a little bit of help. It's time that everyone learns about our legal rights. We need to feel safe. Everyone needs to learn about our rights. It's time for change. Excellent. And I'll have okay. you know when we're watching the video, I didn't look away. Well, I looked away pri primarily because I hate seeing myself on screen, um, <laughs> but it was also uh, I legit needed to finish my breakfast.
no problem, Sarah J. That's the perfect time to to finish your breakfast. Yep. And yeah, you're right. You you were part of this um, music video, as was many or all of the other respecting rights members and self advocates from across Ontario. We even had some self advocates from I think Ottawa as well too. Some of yep. our francophone self advocates that we've partnered with over the years. Um, and this is one of the ways that we utilize our funding is to do legal rights education workshops, um, materials, and also videos like this. So I wasn't a part of this one, unfortunately, but it looked like it was a lot of fun. Um, so a fun fact that I'm just going to throw out there. I was not part of the Respecting Rights core group prior to the video. Um, I was, uh, as soon as we were broken into like different like groups to like do the interview. It was after I did the interview with the other person that um, Sue Huttons grabbed me and said, we want you part of the core group. So that's kind of how it, that's kind of how I became a core group member. And that's how we ask a lot or, or have a lot of our core group members join us is that they hear about some of the initiatives that we do yep. want to be involved and then want to continue to be involved. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing that. That's a great example of how we have members join us. Yeah. So in 2020, um, we had a lawyer and social worker come and present to the shared learning forum on my voice, my choice phase one. So I'm not going to get too um, much detail or go too into this because we have done a presentation before and if I'm not mistaken I think it might be on connectability um, but I thought it would be important just to share. So we had gotten funding from the Heronia class action lawsuit when there was leftover funding there and we decided to that we wanted to improve the lives of people with disabilities and the way that we would do that is to help them learn about their right to make decisions through a series of workshops. Um, and so we partnered with agencies all around Ontario. I think there were three different agencies, um, one in the West, so with London, one in central Toronto, and then in the East with Ottawa. And we worked with self-advocates and we really wanted to know what topics of our workshops were important to them. So they identified four main uh, topics. The first one was on relationship decision-making rights, money decision-making rights, healthcare, and daily living decision-making rights. And so we created, I think it was eight weeks worth of um, workshops for these participants. And then we decided to study how our work help people with intellectual disability to learn about their rights. So we utilize some of that funding to hire um, Evians to evaluate our project. Um, we had asked um, workshop participants, self-advocates to complete surveys, as you will see on the right-hand side, this is an example of one of our surveys, um, after each session. And then once all of the um, workshops were finished with all the agencies, we had self-advocates come together without ARCH and without respecting rights to meet with Evian's evaluators in order to um, have a non-biased evaluation. So we had four main research questions that we wanted to know about. The first one was, is it possible to create supported decision-making circles for people labeled with an intellectual disability? Have people learned any new information or skills from the Respecting Rights workshops? Do the Respecting Rights workshops about supported decision-making help people? And do the Respecting Rights workshops help people be more involved in decisions about their life? Now, the whole uh, Evian's report evaluation can be found on our website if you're interested. But what we found was that 83% of self-advocates said that they learned new things about their rights from our sessions. In terms of confidence to advocate for themselves, 57% um, had said that they felt a lot more confident to advocate for themselves. 29% said a little bit more confident. And then um, some self-advocates said that there were no change. But what we found really interesting was that there wasn't one self-advocate who said that they um, felt less comfortable or less confident. So, um, we had gotten the feedback that said, you know, it was basically a positive experience. And what we taken from that evaluation is that um, the work that we were doing was teaching people, giving them a voice and making change. 
So our Get Connected campaign, this campaign was um, launched in the height of the pandemic. Many of us know that passport funding had made changes to their eligible expenses for technology, but what we were hearing from self-advocates was that they had this technology, but they weren't receiving support to use it. And so you can see on the right-hand side, it's just one of our Facebook posts, um, encouraging staff and family members to help people get connected. Because what we heard was that self-advocates were feeling isolated um, due to not being able to connect with family and friends. Um, they didn't feel like they were receiving um, the required support to learn how to use the devices and um, get online. So there was still a gap between having the technology and not being able to use it. And then they said that their they felt like their mental health and well-being was um, being affected as a result. And so we launched the campaign in August of 2020, and like I said, encouraged staff to use it. Um, we asked agencies to provide opportunities for people to access the internet and also access it in a way that was confidential. A lot of people were saying that when they did have access to speak with family or friends or to engage in online workshops or activities, that it was done in a like an open setting, let's say like the living room or the kitchen, where they didn't have privacy. So it was really important for people not only to learn how to use this technology, access it, but also to have their privacy as well. And then we have the five things campaign, which is probably one of my favorite campaigns and one that I would love to um, be able to revisit. So when Respecting Rights heard about the proposed developmental services reform that the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services uh, says that it was embarking on, also called Journey to Belonging, we heard and we had self-advocates gather to talk about um, these changes to make sure that we have the voices of self-advocates heard. But what we did was we brought nine self-advocacy groups together um, and we heard that a lot of the self-advocates did not know about these changes or didn't understand what these changes entailed and how it would affect them. Um, they also said that any information that they had heard about this was not accessible and not in plain language. So we decided to work with Arch Lawyers and Respecting Rights, and we sent letters to the ministry on December 31st, 2020, um, basically saying that we wanted to meet with them. We wanted them to hear the stories of self-advocates. And then on April 8th, 2021, Respecting Rights launched the Five Things campaign. We were able to meet with the ministry. They were great in hearing the stories um, about what our self-advocates were going through. Uh, we were able to ask questions and have our questions answered. Um, and so I think overall it was a good meeting, but what we've heard from self-advocates recently is that the updates are still not accessible. So we created five key priorities. Now this is not an extensive, uh, like it's extensive list. We have um, a lot more, um, I guess, topics that we wanted to talk about with the ministry, but we decided to break it down into five key priorities that we wanted to see changes in developmental services. So this includes people voices need to be heard, so the government should uh, learn from self-advocates by having regular accessible meetings with them, making complaints accessible. Now we also offer a uh, rights complaint based workshop where we teach people that it is okay to make complaints in developmental services when they feel like their supports, um, they have questions or concerns about their supports um, and how to do that. Many people have stated that they don't actually know how to make a complaint in developmental services. So. One thing we want the government to know is that um, making complaints should be accessible for people with disabilities. The third thing is, is that everyone should have the same rights. So um, everyone who uses developmental services should have the same rights and rights in developmental services should be um, in like written in the law, it should be included in law and policies um, when they're considering changes to developmental services. Fourth one would be better staff training, that uh, self-advocates feel that developmental services staff um, need better training about their legal rights for people with disabilities. And even though we're not a in a training right now, you're in more of a presentation to learn about what we do. I think it's really great that you are here today or watching the recording of this video, because then you have an understanding of what our disability is, what respecting rights is, 
Yes, and if yeah. any of the people that you support, if any of the people that you support uh, have any questions or concerns, you know where to turn if they need any legal advice. And then the last one I think I touch base on is just accessible technology, that the information being presented to people with intellectual disabilities need to be accessible, especially when you're talking about uh, changes to developmental services, to funding, um, not only just in plain language, but also in being able to access like different types of accessible technology, making sure that documents are offered in different varieties of ways, so that way people can really have an understanding of of what they're learning of what the changes are okay sarah j um, i'm just looking at the time we do have a little bit of time um, but if you want to talk briefly about our accessible land development work because i still want to have time for us to yeah, share absolutely. what we're um, doing yeah so this was essentially i don't want to say my birth child because that just makes it sound weird but um essentially it it what it essentially is my birth child because um, I was the one that brought forward the idea. Um, I won't I won't say each bullet point because I know like we are getting short on time. Um, but in a nutshell, it's um, basically I brought the idea forward um, because with the uh, we did we did create one with a core group member. Um, something that we we wanted we wanted something to that we could identify um as part of the disability community but then also not taking it away from the real um the real meaning um and still and still honoring um the native uh the native people mm -hmm. And, and we partnered with Community Living Six Nations to learn about what rec reconciliation means and the importance of creating a meaningful and intentional land acknowledgement. Um, so we did partner with agencies. We heard stories um, from people with lived experience and we were able to present the work that we do on accessible land acknowledgement in September of 2022 at the Speaking Out Conference. Gonna, I was just gonna yeah. say that, the fo that, that, photo, uh, that photo was that photo was taken um, at a speaking out conference where um, yeah, we yeah. were we presented our uh, we presented our work, which was really really cool. Yeah, it was. Go ahead, Sarah. It was a lot of fun too. Um, so our current projects and initiatives, um, we do the coffee and advocacy monthly meetings, which. I don't want to embarrass you, Jessica, but uh, before you became a mother, uh, this was your birth child. Um, <laughs> then we did. Then we do um, prevent the um, provincial quarterly meetings, um, and then we also do free legal rights education workshops. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so as Sarah J said, this was. Um, the I think my first initiative coming to Arch, one that really I had the pleasure of starting, um, which I'm really proud of, and I think it's it's one that um, we're just really excited to have self advocates connect with. So this initiative is funded by the City of Toronto. We do have funding from them, and we wanted to um, create like a, a monthly meetings with self-advocates from the GTA um, that could really come together. Um, we offer these meetings both in person and in Zoom. And then um, these these meetings are a little bit different than um, our regular like quarterly mm -hmm. meetings or workshops. So our quarterly meetings and our workshops are very structured. We have like themes, topics, and we do here too but this is more of a peer support meetings, right, Sarah J? Like you and the rest of the respecting yeah. rights members. Yeah, if you want to talk about like quickly yeah, sure. how, how you do uh, it, I want, yeah, you do. It's really yeah. like the coffee and advocacy monthly meetings. They're really, they're really very casual. Um, the core group members um, get together uh, on Zoom prior, uh, prior to that kind of to brainstorm various ideas or topics um, that we bring forward to the group um, each time. And it it's we're not 
uh, we don't run the, yes, we're the ones that facilitate the group, but we're not the ones running it. We're just presenting the idea, the topics, but it's really an opportunity for the, partic the participants to share what they want to share. And then we take, we, we write notes and we take away from what they've said to be, to go off other, um, other uh, topics that we think would bring attend bring a lot of discussion. Thank you. And now this year is really exciting because now we have uh, a lawyer at Arch and law students who will be oh, yeah. joining our team to come. <laughs> yes, yeah, exciting. Yeah, starting next month. And they'll be coming um, to our meetings to basically hear from self-advocates and to talk about what the law says about some of the issues or concerns that they bring up. And then the lawyers, uh, law students in particular, with myself and respecting rights members, we create plain language pamphlets um, to give to participants or to post online um, after each ses uh, session. So this is an example of uh, one of the pamphlets that we had done in December of 2022. It talks about our topics, uh, about respecting rights and coffee and advocacy. And then we will just have, um, starting in March, probably changes to this where we'll have some information about what the law says about the specific topic that um, was discussed in that meeting. And then we have provincial quarterly meetings. So these are offered every three months in March, June, and September for self-advocates across Ontario. Like I said, these ones are a little bit more specific. Um, this is an old flyer, so please don't write down these dates if you're interested in having any of the people that you support um, to join us. Um, but basically the purpose of these meetings is for respecting rights to give updates on what we're doing and also to hear from self-advocates. And if we're doing any law reform work, such as the Five Things campaign, this is where we would come together with all the self-advocates and sort of do our work by hearing the voices of them. And then again, we're really excited to have a lawyer and law student join our quarterly meetings come March. So that's a new change. Well, we had lawyers pre-pandemic and then pandemic hit. And so now that um, things are opening up a little bit more, we're uh, excited to work with the lawyers again. Uh, it's also uh, just to uh, touch on that. If we have, ex if we have um, expressed interest, um, in because we're always wanting to build on um our core group uh if if there's expressed interest um then we always ask uh we all um we always um if they're uh, if they're um from like toronto base um and they're interested we always ask them to join um, one of the quarterly meetings so they can kind of get a better feel in terms of um, what the core group does. Um, and then they go through like a like proper screening process to make sure that they're a good fit. That's a good point. Yes, we do use our workshops um, and our uh, quarterly meetings and even coffee and advocacy to get to know the people that are joining and to um, do like a recruitment, right? If anybody would like Pretty to much, join yeah. and be a volunteer. Yeah, it's, we, we use those meetings as a recruitment to um, grow our team. Pretty much. That's a great point. Yeah, thank you, Sarah J. Yeah, no worries. Oh, so lastly, um, the third thing that we're really working on and that is ongoing is our free legal rights education workshops. Um, and this is where we partner with social service agencies, developmental service agencies, to offer these workshops to the people that you support uh, throughout Ontario. And like I said in uh, previous slides, like we really focus on decision-making rights, rights to access your own money, rights to uh, be in a relationship with who you choose, rights to healthcare, um, rights to make a complaint. Those are sort of the, the topics and the themes that we present on. And then, um, we do use a variety of techniques when teaching. I don't know, Sarah J, if you want to um, maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, it's probably one of our fun things that we do, like the types of ways that we teach people. Role playing. Do, yeah, role playing. We use that's music. Always, that that's always uh, that's always a really popular. Uh, that's a that's always a really popular thing that gets uh, that gets a group going um we typically 
if we're doing workshops um, we pick a theme for well not really a theme but uh, music that we want to play um, just just at the beginning whilst people are come whilst um, participants are joining because um, that makes it uh, it makes it fun and um, I guess those are the two really like big things that I would bring forward because it's the two things that stick in my mind basically <laughs> yeah and meaningful discussions right hearing oh, yeah. people's voices <laughs> yeah giving people an opportunity to share we do hear a lot of like just natural conversation and I think that's where Sarah J and the rest of the respecting rights members where you come in and you offer that peer support. So yes, we do yeah. like a legal portion where we educate about rights. Like Sarah J said, we use music, we use role plays, but then we also use that peer support where people um, can hear and, and feel comfortable with sharing with other people with lived experience. I think that that's really important. That's also um, why, why I like the uh, music bit is talking a, a, a lot of, some of the stuff that we bring forward and we like to talk about um can be really can be really complex and Happy, so that's right? why we it like bringing in the music it engage it helps engage people and it kind of just makes things it just normalizes things yeah bring some fun to it and i think at first it was hard to um do this work virtually um, you know, getting people yeah. engaged um, virtually, but we just continued to do these workshops to connect with with people, and um, we really found that um, there was people who were interested. Like every week, there was questions: Are we doing a role play today? Are we going to be listening to music today? Um, so I think that this work, um, having those different factors, really um, amplifies the work that we do and really um, gets people and engaged also, and comfortable. And we also get a lot of really great feedback in terms of, you know, I'll, I, n nine times out of 10, um, one of the biggest feedbacks that we get is the role-playing that they really, yeah. they could really relate. And with the role-playing, we always make a point of saying, you know, this isn't, this isn't real this is like it's all it's all um we're all just acting it but it's to help depict kind of what reality is but it's just a fun way of it's it's a fun way of doing it it's practicing right it's it's yeah. practicing the skills and being able to develop the skills to advocate for yourself so some situations and that's fun would be it is, yeah. And some situations would be maybe going to the doctor or um, maybe advocating um, for your rights when it comes to like staff. Um, Can I bring up one key thing? Things like that. that sure. Like, um, if I think uh, in one instance, um, in a group home situation, uh, someone was asked that they weren't allowed that they were not allowed to drink pop and their right their their right to drink pop was taken away so that's one like that's that's one fairly popular thing to like that people want because it's it's an easy topic to kind of role play uh and we always do in role playing we always do um, the bad way first, and then we do, and then we do the good way in terms of like, you know, the bad way of dealing with the situation, and then the way it should be dealt with. That's a good point too. Um, I know we talk a lot about role plays, but I think we're just very passionate about the work that we do and the way that we teach. And like Sarah J said, uh, we do have some videos as well too actually online um, that we've done role plays with. And you'll see there's like a black and white colored and that just uh, a, a, like a black and white yeah. color of the video. And that shows you like maybe negative consequences or how things shouldn't be like Sarah J said. And then we show it in 
a colored picture, um, very vibrant and bright, of how the situation yeah. should be handled. And so uh, self-advocates can also go on our YouTube page or our website and see those videos as well. But yes, we could probably talk about the way that we present our information for, for a long time, oh, I, but we're oh. just... Yeah, oh, we're I just could, so passionate I, about it. I could talk I could talk on and on and on and on and on, but we don't have that time. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about Sarah J, why this work is important to us. Because yep. um yeah, I think historically we know that the rights of people with disabilities have been stripped away from them. If you think about the history of the institutions, um, think about all the abuse and neglect that people with disabilities have faced. And then today we still hear stories from self-advocates who say that they feel like they don't have um, an opportunity to make a choice in their life or they feel like um, their choices aren't being respected. So from my perspective as an advocacy staff, someone who's worked in developmental services for 10 years and now works for Arts Disability Law Center, uh, teaching people about their legal rights, I think that the work that we do is important because like teaching people about their rights um, really gives them the knowledge and the confidence and the skills to be able to advocate for themselves and their needs. And I think that that's really important with the work that we do and also with the work that you do as support staff as well too. I think it's really important to help someone learn and help someone have the confidence to be able to advocate themselves. When we talk about advocacy, um, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. People with disabilities should have the opportunities to make decisions in their lives. And people with disabilities should have the confidence um, and gain the skills to be able to speak up for themselves when they feel like their rights are being respected. Um, so I think that this work is very important because it it honors their autonomy and it honors um, and, and is respectful to, to them and what they want. And we know historically that that hasn't necessarily been the case. So. Sarah J, I wanted to, this is, I took a quote from one of our videos that I haven't posted yet, but I know that we do some videos or we did some videos like two years ago. And this was one of the quotes that you had said around people with disabilities oh, yeah. need to know I, that they have a voice. I can so, read it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's important for people to learn about their rights because everyone needs to know that they have a voice. And it's important that they feel that they are not being silenced. And so that's basically what that's that kind of opens up a, in terms of why, like, the respecting rights does what we do. Um, because people with disabilities, voices, um, they do feel like they're being silenced and pushed aside, which, quite frankly, someone like myself identifying as having um, IDD really angers me um, because, and we, we prove as a group that we do not have the right to be silenced. Um, and so we fight for the right to be heard. And through our, and through our group, we help others realize that it's not okay that they're being silenced and they do have a voice. Thank you, Sarah J. Yeah, I think that message is so important for everyone to hear. So what's next for respecting rights? So we would love and we continue to offer our monthly and quarterly meetings for self-advocates. We want to grow the respecting rights team. Yes, we want to, that's a big one. That's one of our big uh, missions. And then continue to collaborate with developmental service agencies, like the ones that you work for, the ones that you're um, here uh, today with, and then continue to offer accessible law reform work and trying to meet with the government to make possible uh, positive change within the developmental service sector. And so we're really here today, and we appreciate your time, but we're really yes, here today you. to... <laughs> To, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, to, to give you some information about what arts disability does and what respecting rights does. But we also want to encourage you and the um, people that you support to get involved with us. Um, so what we ask is and encourage is that you visit our website and our Facebook page or that you help the people that you support access our website and Facebook page to learn a little bit more about what we do and who we are. 
we would love it if um, you're interested to get in contact with me to host a coffee and advocacy meeting with us. Whether that's virtual or on site, we are happy to bring the coffee and drinks and the treats. And most importantly, we would love the opportunity to um, come to your organization and host a six week legal rights education workshop for the people that you support. Yes. Um, and yeah, I, I think that um, we are just so grateful to be able to speak today. And we are so passionate, as you can probably tell, about the work that we do at Arch Disability Law Center and respecting rights. And um, no, I guess not. we'll leave we're not leave proud. it up. We're not. We're not proud about it at all. <laughs> if there's still time for questions, I think that would be great. Deanna, I'm not sure if we have time for questions, um, but we really appreciate you hearing us today. And um, here's my contact information. You can email me at jessica.field at arch.clcj.ca if you have any questions or you want to get your self-advocates involved or if you'd like to host a meeting or a workshop, you can get in touch with me.